Good afternoon, everybody. This is Steve Brummer, a partner with 151 Advisors, thanking everyone that's here listening to us on Bright Talk. Uh, we are um, joined today by Ben Easterling, who is with AT&T's IoT Smart Cities Group as a strategic alliance leader. And good afternoon, Ben. How are you? Hey, good afternoon and good morning for those that uh, different time zone. Thanks, Steve, that's for right. uh, for having me. No worries. So everybody that's uh, listening in, a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, ideas here. So you have, based on your screen, the ability to send in questions uh, to us for us to be able to uh, respond back. And please send them during the presentation. You don't have to wait to the end, even though we will have enough time for Q&A uh, at the end of this and during it. But uh, Ben and I are pretty open, interactive guys, and so we are interested in being able to answer questions that you may have during the presentation is, is fine, too. Uh, if you go to the attachments in the links area, you'll see that uh, the presentation is downloadable as, as well as you have links to both the uh, 151 site as well as the AT&T site, uh, and you also will have all of our contact information to be able to use there. So the way we're going to do this is we have a couple of poll questions that we're going to ask during the pro, uh, process of the, of the program uh, for the next uh, 58 minutes or so that we have. And uh, we're going to be able to uh, get that response, and you'll see the response back on what we are asking you to, to answer for us. Uh, I'm going to give some slides, then Ben's going to give some slides, and then we're going to open up to uh, dialogue and answering of your questions. So it's going to be pretty easy to go about. So when Bright Talk reached out to us to put on this webinar, it was, okay, we can talk a lot about, and we are going to talk about applications and service offerings within the Smart Cities program. But one of the intriguing piece was how are we all making money in smart cities? So we want to know who you are and what is um, you know what you're doing and uh, within the industry. So here comes um, the uh, one of the first questions, and I want to ask where's the uh, first one? Uh, back to the list. No, oh, there we go. So the first question that we have is what are your roles? Uh, within your company. So we want to know who's on the on the call right now. Just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing and uh, as far as a percentage of uh, of the people on the call. So uh, you should be able to go out now and there and of course that's what I kind of figured that most of us are in business development or sales of some um, some sort. So that makes uh, that makes a lot uh, of more sense from that standpoint. So, all right, so let's go into the presentation um, so we can continue to uh, move this forward. So just give you a little bit of background on 151 Advisors. We are an international strategy and execution-based firm. Our whole concept is we do not build, create, or design any hardware or software or applications or services. We help you or help companies within the world of mobile and smart cities and IoT monetize your products and commercialize them in the industry. So we are a company that helps you put uh, your products out into the certain markets, accelerate the growth in the services, and try and figure out ways to drive revenue, make money, and ultimately increase shareholder value. So that's all we do for people on a worldwide basis. And uh, it's been working out fantastic. So if you look, here's a, a smattering of some of the global clients and partners that we have on a worldwide basis. Many of those are current clients, and uh, gives you a little idea of who we're connected to. Uh, as it relates to some of the partners, we will be working with GSMA at Mobile World Congress Americas in September to be putting on day two of the IoT Summit. So we are going to be out there helping them uh, with content and with presentations and things around that. So as we look at monetizing smart cities, where is the money? Today in smart cities, there's a lot of projects that are going on from garbage to street lights to parking to all the other aspects that we know. But the biggest issue is where is the money? Uh, as citizens, we are trying to figure out where 
the money is going to be spent because it's our money that we're pro pro providing. There are a lot of public-private partnership opportunities that are going on, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the presentation. And so if you look at the money, we're interested in how can we make money. And if you look at the background of the companies that are on, the, uh, on this and took the poll just now, 33% of you are executive management, 33% are technical, 19% are business development, and the rest are sales and software. So from an executive management standpoint, it's really trying to figure out where can we take our products, services, and applications and make money within the ecosystem? Who's going to be the single throat to choke to be able to get things deployed within those cities? Um, and what are what's in it for citizens? So that's a really big part of what we're looking at from a monetization standpoint. So when we look at the growth of the connected infrastructure, today the, the, the class of assets and the exponential growth of the smart cities are around buildings, parking garages, parking meters, streets and street signs and lights and trash and garbage trucks and related to it. That's where we're seeing the most usage of uh, monetizing smart cities. But if we start to look at some of the technology and where things are, the growth is absolutely incredible. Uh, of course, most of it is going to be in the larger cities and municipalities that are involved with it. So if you look at where we are going, it's very similar to the curve that we're seeing in IoT uh, across the board with the ultimate growth over the next several years being you know, just crazy numbers. And all I can say is that if uh, all of us on this call are interested in these types of industries, you look at the idea of saying, okay, there's a lot of money to be made out there. There's a lot of opportunities for us to work together to try and be able to provide uh, these smart cities around the world with what we do. So if you look at Gartner, saying that 50% of the citizens in large cities will share their personal data with smart cities, we have to look at the idea of open data and who owns that data. It's a debate that continues to be um, discussed in a lot of different areas. You know, who owns the data within a smart city? Is it the city? Is it the citizens? Um, you know, is it under the open data aspect? So that's a lot of, um, uh, you know, data that's going to be generated. We just have to figure out, you know, how that works. Um, and then when you look at the research found that only 16% of municipalities surveyed so that they would self-fund the uh, city uh, initiative, most of the deals that are being done right now are related to private partner, private public partnership uh, opportunities. So, if you look at Cleveland and um, in Columbus, Ohio, and you look at many of the other ones in the U.S., that's where the growth of the money is coming from. It all can't come from the government agencies. But when you look at the international markets like India and China. A majority of those are being supplied, the funding for these developments are being done by government agencies. So it's a little different when you start to work on uh, the, uh, the money and where this stuff is coming from on a worldwide basis. So if you look at what we believe are going to be within smart cities, what are some of the major areas that are of focus and are where, where people are buying things? Building management systems is top of mind as it relates to how it's part of a smart city because when you have the citizens inside those smart buildings, they're part of the smart city initiative across the board. And so if you look at building management systems and, and the increase in the market share and you look at the players that are involved, the, you know, the numbers are astronomical. Um, we believe that when we look at commercial buildings and the things that go inside a building from the sensors to control access to smart parking to HVAC controls and elevator controls and all that, all of that gets bundled into the idea that it's part of a smart city. If we look at some of the deals that are being done, the city halls and the city municipal buildings and the schools and things like that are sometimes the first ones to get 
some sort of funding to be able to uh, bring something forward uh, as far as the product is concerned. So if we look at the smart building ecosystem and its capabilities, you know, this is a chart that we have built together to look at seeing who is the influencers, the partners, the buyers and the informed people within the ecosystem within a building. Um, it is an amazing scenario of how many different companies are actually involved in this type of slide. When you see the build, the partners that are involved, you cannot do this alone. That's one of the amazing things about smart cities. You can't, just one company can't do it all. And so we have to figure out how to be partners in the ecosystem and be able to work with you know, all of the companies like the utilities and the designers and the architects and the building developers and the tenants and the owners, all of these people in the wheel here are part of the ecosystem within a smart building that also then are affected by what's going on in a smart city. When we look at another opportunity you know, within the smart building, this is a, a, design, a designed infographic that we did here to show a little bit more about the value generation of the smart building and the ecosystem around. And it's, I know it's a lot of information here to look at, but you know, if you start to put all these layers together, it, you realize that there are a lot of pieces to a smart building uh, as well as a smart city that need to be a, addressed. Um, right now, I would say there's a couple of pet peeves that we're missing within the smart cities arena that need to get done. One is lack of education. Uh, we are having a hard time educating not only the cities and the uh, people within technology within the cities as to what a smart city is and what it can be for them. We're, we need to help educate the vendors and the participants uh, it, that it, that want to get involved in smart cities and smart buildings and, and everything around it, uh, even educating of students. So most of the smart cities opportunities on a worldwide basis, including China and India, are involving local colleges or, or, or some kind of educational institution. And over the last year, I've spoken at four colleges and trying to, in trying to educate the people, with, whether they're in computer sciences or data analytics and, in, uh, and information, trying to educate them on what a smart city is, what the IoT business and world is all about. So it's a, it's a lot about education. And then the last part is systems integration. Someone is going to have to put all this together. Uh, I know Ben from AT&T is having this conversation on a day in, day out basis. And he'll have an opportunity to explain a little bit more about what AT&T is doing and being able to handle that piece. Smart parking continues to be a huge uh, market in, within the uh, smart city. Um, if you start to look at some of the things that integrate between the businesses and the cities and the people, parking seems to be the one of the easiest ones. But as many of us on the, on the call may know about like the city of San Francisco's parking program that they put together, you know, one of the ROIs for them was not necessarily increased revenue from parking, but actually the reduction of carbon emissions by 25% because cars didn't have to run around the city and try and find the open space. Whereas in other areas around the world where they're looking at smart parking, it is strictly all about revenue generation. But it is smart cities uh, as part of a smart parking application, that's, it's a really huge aspect of it. When we look at smart streets and street lights, that continues to be a huge use case. Um, many companies and maybe many companies are selling smart street lights and smart integration and, and it's not just about light bulbs anymore. It is more about the idea of what you can do for efficiency within within those cities and in, increasing efficiency by 50 to 75 percent is an outcome, but there are significant savings that's happening on from a smart streets and the street light programs that are out there. As we look at waste management, uh, that is continues to be a huge growth factor for a smart city. Um, as you, I'm going to give you the example that uh, I was out in Barcelona. I don't know how many people were in the on, in the audience 
were actually in Barcelona for Mobile World Congress. But as you know, in Barcelona, they were one of the first ones to really implement a citywide trash waste management system where the uh, trash bins are all monitored for capacity and then they route the trucks quicker to be able to pick up the ones that are filled up but not necessarily wasting the time and the productivity hours to pick up ones that are not. After being in Barcelona and meeting with the city officials in this group, I come to find out that Yes, the system is working flawlessly. Yes, they are getting the information. And yes, those bins that are filling up are uh, being picked up fast and, and, and sooner. But the ROI for them wasn't necessarily what I thought it was going to be. They originally had thought that they were going to be able to reduce the amount of trucks on the road. And they were going to obviously then be able to reduce some of the people that were in, involved in the trucks to pick up the trash. And that never happened. They have the same amount of trucks. They have the same amount of people. So it's interesting to be able to look at what the goal is for certain situations and certain in certain applications as it relates to smart cities. When we look at local advertising, I can give you um, an example of what we did in, in Taiwan. Uh, the city of Taipei was putting in a smart cities program. They were uh, interested in trying to figure out how to get our ROI. And so they have tsunami warning system for citizens. They also have parking, transportation, pollution controls, all within their Smart City Citizen app. And one of the things that they were trying to figure out in their quest to try and get an ROI or to have some kind of income coming to be able to offset the cost of the Smart City, we talked to them about advertising revenue and building a citizen used advertising uh, location-based marketing program and they deployed that and now are generating hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year from a location advertising program involved with their smart cities application. So as we look at ways of being able to generate revenue, those are really all you know ways of being able to come up with ideas. So when we look at that, that you know, we have to try and figure out a way to be able to go about uh, generating some kind of revenue overall uh, for being able to put together uh, a strategy for particular companies. So that's a really brief overview of some of the ideas that we have come up with. Uh, we believe that the worldwide growth opportunities in smart cities is significant. Um, it's all, and it's all about partnerships. Uh, you just cannot do it alone. You have to be able to figure out ways to be able to provide a complete, total, integrated solution to a city, regardless of where they are. Um, obviously, when governments are involved, it takes a little longer and it's a little bit more painful. But as some government agencies have shown, uh, they have the ability to manage it and deploy and do a very, very good job. So when we look at where we're headed, that's our opinion um, from where we're seeing uh, some opportunities going on. So let's go, and this is where we're having another break. I'm gonna throw another question at you right now. So what is your involvement today in smart cities? You know, how are you, um, are you doing this uh, to, uh, are you involved? Are you not involved? Have you not done anything? Have you helped in deploying projects? Or you're just thinking about a smart cities project because of the changes that are going on. So while you're voting, we did get a couple of questions in from the audience, and I'm going to try and do this. And Ben, Ben, please help me on answering this question um, from the audience. When a town or city municipality decides to go smart from scratch, for example, in Latin America, we're looking at a multi-year strategic plan. How do you make sure that plan does not get stopped maybe halfway by a change in city authority, government authorities, and related new interests brought in by the new team? In other words, how do you ensure continuation in the strategy plan? Well, thank you very much for that, that question, and that is a problem. Um, most of the time, it's got to be taken care of in the original budget. So if we're getting budgets for smart cities that are out five or ten years, usually you are 
um, avoiding any governmental changes in meaning in mayors or city council people uh, in getting involved. So you, you do have to look at being able to uh, find ways to make sure that the budgets are for a long term and based on deployments. So Ben, do you have any response to that too? Hey, hey Steve, no, I think that's spot on. The only add I would have is that with the right business case that supports that long-term budget, those two coupled gives, gives the leadership team, mayor and city council, the, the, the evidence, the background to support um, from their residents, from their citizens, that these are good, prudent citizens, uh, decisions for their taxpayers. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, Ben, it is time for you. Um, just so get give you a, a quick vote from the audience. So right now, 52% of the people are thinking about doing a smart cities project. 28% are deploying it, and 19 are have not been doing any have not done anything yet. So Ben, it looks like we have a lot of people that are experienced out here. 28% uh, deploying already. So. Let's, uh, we're just got to give them some tidbits of information to help them continue to deploy these projects. So you're oh, that on, Ben. Great. Yeah, no, I appreciate the handoff here. And, and so this is Ben Asterling, uh, AT&T. I'm in the IoT Internet of Things Smart City organization with AT&T. Um, my background is um, primarily investor-owned utilities uh, and telecom. And so um, IoT has been around for a long, long time. First started kind of machine to machine and, and moved to, to other um, things attached to the Internet, attached to the wireless network. So, but give you a little background on AT&T that you may not be aware of. We're the world's largest communi communications company. We've got a long-term strategy to lead the world in communications, media, and technology, certainly with our acquisition of DirecTV and hopefully here soon, um, the approved Time Warner acquisition will create a large communication media and technology company that we want to want to be. Um, 256,000 employees. We're in 60 plus countries, um, you know, across the world. 225 countries are served by AT&T services. And uh, if you can think about what petabytes, well, 197 petabytes across the AT&T backbone in a day. So it's a lot of data, and certainly with IoT, that's going to be growing. One of the key questions we always get about that data is how secure it is. AT&T's got a really strong, secure platform um, from the platform itself to the edge device to monitoring the traffic, and then we do an overall threat management uh, on that security so that we ensure that everything across that network is highly secure. And the other cute, uh, good fact is that we've invested $140 billion from 2013 to 2017, and that's really around a couple of key initiatives to, to deliver a simple and intuitive customer experience. We want that customer experience to be flawless and seamless, and, and in doing so, we're trying to lead in the connectivity and integration solutions, particularly IoT. Um, the other statement is that over the last five years, AT&T has invested more in the U.S. Uh, than any other public company, and certainly with the d additional tax incentives, AT&T is taking advantage of those and, and going to be deploying our capital more. The other key thing is that we're a highly diverse company, um, and we really define diversity more than just the numbers that are stated there. It's really around where did you grow up, where did you go to school, your professional experience, and we think that, that um, the value of diversity helps AT&T be, be a great company. Um, so why is AT&T kind of in the smart city space? We really got started in third quarter of 2015, wanted to leverage our highly secure and robust network that's out there in the marketplace today. Uh, and so today we've got over 38 million connected devices. Um, they, they range from <clears throat> excuse me, wearables to connected cars. So it's over 2,200 types of devices in the marketplace. A big initiative is certainly around the connected car with the nearly 18 million of those connected cars. We're working with all the major OEM manufacturers in Atlanta. We've got a drive studio where we do a lot of, if you will, skunk work in our foundry there to create new applications. Um, more than 400 million uh, 4GLT people in business coverage 
across the uh, U.S. And then 5G, heard a lot about 5G. We've launched in parts of 23 major metros. It's important, certainly from an IoT smart city standpoint. 5G is low latency, high speed. Uh, one of the applications I like to talk about is t autonomous vehicles. Um, we've deployed uh, with the city of Atlanta on North Avenue Smart Corridor, autonomous vehicle, kind of a shuttle bus um, kind of effort. But but the, the key fact here is that on the 4G LTE network, uh, by the time that vehicle gets a signal, that vehicle's traveled four feet. So it's the difference between making your right turn or, or making a right turn into Starbucks. But on a 5G LTE network, that same vehicle crowd travels 0.1 feet. And so you can see from the low latency and certainly high speeds, that 5G will support certainly autonomous vehicles in the, in the future. AT&T created a framework as we entered the marketplace. Um, we really wanted to leverage kind of the first two columns, our secure connectivity and scalable platforms, which is certainly our core business. Um, but we wanted to create a framework where we helped work with our, our municipalities, which, which most of them are our, our current customers today. And really it was around these five vertically integrated solutions. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, but in doing so from a go-to-market strategy, we wanted to create strategic alliances with key leaders in the marketplace, not only from brand recognition, but certainly from a culture standpoint, technology standpoint, and fit with us doing business. You can see the list of, of our strategic alliance partners there that we've got. Part of the strategy was to create spotlight cities where we created nine cities across the U.S. where with our strategic alliance partners, we went to deliver um, up to three use cases in each of those cities. We launched that in early 2016 and are collecting data on through 2018 uh, with these partners and others. And so it was a way for us to, AT&T, to understand what's the contracting vehicle with the, the city, how many different silos within the city did we need to work with, what's value to the city, what's the city's needs, and then, and then furthermore, create what's the right business case for the city, right? How does the city say yes to all these new technologies that Steve talked about earlier that are coming in the marketplace um, and create the right value proposition with the city? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we got really involved as thought leadership, just listed a few applications and, and associations that we've been involved in. Insight is another one. We'll talk a little bit about that one uh, later on. But obviously, AT&T wanted to take a leadership position, be involved uh, in working with, with companies like Steve's and others across the industry to understand what's going on. And so we created this framework. This is what we're moving forward with as we go to market, working with the municipalities. Hey, Ben, on the strategic alliances, you got a lot of big companies there. Maybe some of them are on the, on this, on the webinar right now. Has, how have you handled the challenges with all those companies and working together to supply everything for the client or for the city? Well, it's a great question, Steve, and, and really we've taken the approach that we want AT&T to take the lead. Um, the foundation to any smart city is connectivity. We believe wireless connectivity and certainly ours being as secure and robust as it is, um, is that foundation. And so part of our strategy with strategic alliances was, was again, cre finding those companies that we're aligned with but, but at the CEO level, right, to, to go tackle this market together. And so from a city perspective, they lean on AT&T. We then work collaboratively with each of these um, vendors and, and uh, strategic alliance uh, partners that we've got so that the city um, has one voice, one contact, and then we disseminate that, that discussion along through a collaboration with our strategic alliance partners here. Excellent. Thank you. No, great, great question. Um, and so you saw on the previous slide the five vertically integrated solutions or domains that I call them. And they're, they're really around energy and utilities, transportation, citizen engagement, public safety, and infrastructure. And the work that we did with our municipalities um, through the Spotlight City efforts, certainly our consultants that we've uh, consulted with, 
we, we felt like these were the key domains that were important to the cities. Energy and utilities really around, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you create um, efficiencies for the, the municipalities themselves? As Steve talked about, they own buildings, um, you know, are high energy users from the utilities perspective. And so smart grid solutions, you know, AMI, automatic metering infrastructure, how do we leverage the, the core network, our wireless network to do automatic metering uh, electric gas and water. Smart lighting, um, a lot about smart lighting that seems to be kind of the foundation or initial phase for many municipalities across the U.S. How do they convert high pressure sodium to LED lights, um, you, know, you know, to create that uh, and leverage their vertical assets uh, in the market. Water management, private LTE are kind of uh, along the same lines. Transportation, you know, we, we, based on studies, we know that 40% of the urban traffic is folks trying to find a place to park. Um, I, I live in Atlanta. Um, Steve lives in Atlanta, and I'll tell you that it's not only me trying to find a place to park, but it's also me trying to navigate one-way streets. So the quicker you get me off the street, you know, the, the better I am in terms of just my experience in the city, that I want to come to the city more, which helps drive economic development lowers emissions because I'm not driving around navigating one way streets. I'm, I'm there to find a parking spot. And so Steve gave some really good statistics uh, around that. Citizen engagement obviously is extremely important. It, um, it's around, uh, because we're dealing with elected officials, it's around how do we engage those citizens around more transparency of what the city is doing uh, in terms of how they're spending taxpayer dollars, what additional services can they provide, like public Wi-Fi, hotspots, um, you know, interactive kiosks uh, is another technology that helps from a citizen engagement standpoint. And obviously, to, from the question earlier, uh, administrations change. They either, you know, don't get elected or term out in some cases. This is a way from citizen engagement to allow that current administration to say in stay in place and allow that current vision to proliferate over many years to come because that administration has engaged their citizens in the right way in the right manner. Public safety is obviously very key. It's, it is in all the discussions I have with cities across the U.S., uh, public safety is, is top of their list. How do they keep their residents and citizens safe uh, to, to come downtown to spend their their disposable income in restaurants and retail in the downtown areas. Um, and so video surveillance is really key. We, we certainly are promoting it in our solution as well. We promote it on a wireless network standpoint. We believe in working with a number of the video surveillance companies, um, some of which are listed on our strategic alliances, that you, do, that you can support that on the 4G and certainly the 5G wireless networks. Most of those technologies have onboard storage, so they can do seven-day storage um, and do video on demand. When you do video on demand, then you can certainly uh, ping the edge device and transport that on demand, looking at a very specific event over the wireless network. Gunshot detection, and I don't know how many of you all know much about it, but it's cool applications where you know, you're listening for a gunshot, uh, algorithms are developed to determine, you know, what kind of gun it is, how many shooters there are, um, e even with GIS uh, lat long coordinates, then you're able to to identify, you know, the spot in which that gunshot happened. All that information is fed back to the public safety command center, and then they're able to deploy the right resources, you know, in the right location. Um, hard to, to exactly monetize. There are some work done around it, around uh, murder cases, if you will, um, and we're involved in some of that. But certainly from, a, from just an um, intangible of keeping your resident citizens safe so they're able to come downtown and, and spend their taxpayer dollars or discretionary dollars is a, is a good thing to have. And then certainly infrastructure um, aspects of it. We've got an aging infrastructure um, for, you know, bridges, roads, waters. I know Steve and I experienced an I-85 bridge collapse <laughs> not too long ago and, and nearly shut down the city. 
here in Atlanta. Um, with the right technology from an IoT perspective, we can monitor the stress and vibrations and movement of bridges so that the city can then deploy their limited dollars on those that infrastructure uh, that is most needed as opposed to just a cycle of this bridge is up next, we're going to redo it versus that one. Now they're able to target their dollars, be more efficient in the way they um, spend their, their obviously limited dollars. Unfortunately, Ben, there wasn't any technology in the world that would have prevented that fire from happening. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Lord, it, that, that shut down the city for, I don't know. Hey, but look, kudos to the, to the construction company that was able to, to get that up, what could have been a six or eight month and three months time frame. So hats off to them and to the city leadership at the time. But really what we're talking about is, is you know, what is the city's value proposition? So at the end of the day, they, they can deploy and, and install and manage smart city technologies, um, you know, across their, across their cities. And so I'll tell you, this is work in progress. Our Spotlight City efforts are helping us identify those business cases. A, lots of, a lot of effort and time and resources being spent to understand, you know, the data that's being collected and how you do that. And so this list that we'll go through is not intended to be exhaustive, but just get you to think about what's the right business case from the city's perspective um, as, you, as you work with the city or if any of the city officials are on, um, you know, how do you internally uh, justify this for, for the city itself. So the first bucket is from an operating savings standpoint. Certainly from an energy savings, roadway lighting, converting high pressure sodium to LED lights, right? We talked about that earlier in our five domain efforts. Uh, there want to be, the first one being utilities and energy. Uh, we know that 50 per, 60 percent energy savings just by making that conversion. Many of those can be done on, um, you know, a single business case. If you add controls to those, you can get additional 10 to 20 percent energy savings controls from the standpoint of you're able to dim or brighten the lights, you're able to get alerts on those lights so that uh, you under, understand which are daytime burning lights, which is obviously wasting energy, or nighttime burning lights, which is not helping your residents be secure. And there, therefore, you're able to roll a truck specifically as opposed to um, drive-bys and looking for burning lights. The other thing is that it's, it's key to creating, we think, the platform so that you can do a phased approach on your smart city deployments. Um, many of the RFPs, RFIs, and RFQs we see are around this effort converting their roadway lighting that the city assets, the city owns, to LED and, and create that. Reduced inventory, certainly standardizing on certain wattages and LED fixtures um, and, and, you know, having the data, historical data of, you know, the life expectancy of these lights helps you minita, minita, minimize inventory. Uh, reduced parking support is another OPEX savings. Uh, lots of applications, you know, I just went through kind of my example, but but clearly uh, minimizing the folks that are riding around in their in their little paddy wagons and chalking tires and stuff, applications exist today um, that that allow you to the, to monitor those, how long have they been there, um, allow you to take pictures of the of the tags so that you can um, remotely send, you know, violations to those uh, owners of those cars or trucks and vehicles, that sort of thing. The, the, the next two, building lighting efficiency, building HVAC efficiency, Steve talked a lot about that. Um, th this is municipalities own a lot of buildings, some of which have been um, updated to certain standards, M many of them have not, but, but overall can you can experience a 40% energy savings from interior lighting to uh, uh, window replacements to higher efficient air conditions, HVAC systems um, associated with it, and, and you can create that energy savings or OPEX savings associated with it. Irrigation water savings. Um, I don't know how many of y'all have ridden by, 
uh, you know, commercial development or somebody in your neighborhood where you're, they're watering their yard and it's freaking raining at the same time. Um, smart, smart irrigation allows you to monitor the soil conditions, um, algorithms associated with the weather forecast. And so you can water on a as-needed basis as opposed to a time of schedule basis. We're seeing anywhere from a 20 to 30 percent water savings for those uh, for those users, and so uh, municipalities have parks and and park and rec facilities, ball fields, football fields, uh, and that sort of thing where they're doing irrigation. Smart irrigation is another smart city technology that helps them do savings. Uh, and then the last one that I came up with on OPEX savings, certainly infrastructure maintenance savings. We talked a little bit about that with uh, with the technology that uh, certainly what happened to us in, in Atlanta as well. The other bucket of, of opportunity from an ROI perspective is permitting revenue. And, and it's, a really, it's around a couple of item pole attachment fees. Um, we talked about our small cell deployments, and we're, we're clearly trying to do our small cell deployments. We're negotiating on a regular basis with municipalities for attachment fees. Um, I spent a lot of time in investor-owned utilities, and so I understand pole attachment fees and the revenue that can be generated with it. Cities are recognizing their vertical assets and, and are negotiating those pull attachment fees um, to support small cell technology that will one day support 5G. Today it's to offload the macro towers uh, to provide better experience for wireless carriers customers. But certainly as the municipalities can see it to support 5G, then sorts 5G then supports your smart city applications in a much broader fashion that 4G can, day, can to do today. Hey, ben, you're, ben, you're bringing up communications on those poles, but like in China, uh, they are using those poles now for digital signage, for EV charging capabilities, Wi-Fi hotspots, and all kinds of other additional smart city related uh, offerings off of that same pole in order to generate new sources of revenue. So see, that's a great point, and I just made a note that I really shouldn't say pole attachments. It ought to be <laughs> asset attachments, there you right? Go. Because, yep, no, great point. Uh, buildings, uh, right of way, vertical assets are all assets the city owns that can be monetized and help their um, ROI for this business case. So, so great point. Um, increased issuance of parking tickets. Um, you, you know, this is not a customer engagement sort of <laughs> initiative, but um, it, it certainly is a way to generate uh, additional revenue um, for, for the cities. With the parking technology, you eliminate the OPEX side, and with this application, you increase the parking ticket revenue. We're seeing revenue from a parking ticket standpoint increase as much as 45%. And certainly an aspect under permitting revenues uh, that you need to take advantage of is you do your your um, your um, smart city deployment. The other one, tax revenue vis-a-vis -vis economic development. So I, I really, for my note, I've got a TBD buy it. We're still studying it. We think there's great value in it as well. Um, in it, in it, it's uh, maybe a little bit of anecdotal data, but I draw an analogy here from from Apple if you will, the, the um, platforms that you're creating out there, the digital platforms as you, as you deploy smart city technology generates a lot of data. And so we think that that data will drive um, new businesses to the cities to leverage that data to create new applications. Um, this dovetails into, if you go to the next slide, into the new revenue aspect of it as well, right? So the modernization of data. So as these APIs then are made available to entrepreneurs that are going to move in and, and drive economic development in your city and start new businesses, um, which according to, you know, and I agree with Steve, it's a great way for the cities to re work with our higher education um, institutions that there, like Atlanta's work on the Georgia Tech here on a lot of efforts. 
is the city owns the data. They can make the data available through open APIs, which will drive then economic development, will drive the monetization of their data through through app through the creation of new apps. For example, um, the Apple App Store has brought in forty billion. That's with a B. I know my southern accent. My forty billion for developers since two thousand and eight. Right. Really? And so today, today it's driving twenty one million developers. In two, in twenty twenty five, they're anticipating to drive twenty five million new developers. It's creating one point nine billion jobs, and and so this is the app economy, if you will, um, that Apple has created. We think, and, 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 and in all honesty at TBD, but we think with open access of data, open APIs, that the cities can drive working with their higher institutions, working with the entrepreneurial community, that kind of economic development for their city as well. Hey, Ben, and the one other, of the... Yeah. One question that came out. Of, there is a question there that I'm going to correlate to what you were just talking about. So one question I have from someone here is, you know, how do how do they get involved in a smart city project as someone with technical experience? So what do you where are you seeing the holes and where are you seeing the opportunities for people to get involved in smart cities? Well, so so I think to, uh, um, I'll find one of your initial slides though talked about uh, from a source of of the growth of technology that supports it. And so that's a great place to be, um, certainly from a software developer, and I know we've got a lot of software developers on the, on the call as well, right, because that's really these apps, I believe, and I think at t believes that's the kind of the, the data is the new oil, if you will. Um, but the other aspect of it is, um, from a data scientist, the cities and institutions, higher, higher education institutions, are, need data scientists. They need to understand the data. How do they value the data? How do they monetize that data? And so, to me, those are two areas in which um, folks need to get involved. The data scientist efforts are, are really, really becoming um, needed. For, for example, at t is in the process of hiring a data scientist uh, to help us on our digital infrastructure, and, and I didn't want to talk specifically about technology, but our digital infrastructure that has open APIs um, so that with San Diego that's deploying this, where Atlanta is deploying this, where Portland, Oregon is deploying this, we've hired the data scientist to say, how do you take the data, make it additionally useful, and monetize that for the city, for the city, for the developer community, and so forth. I hope that helps. Yep, absolutely. All right. right. And and then so the other aspect of this is that these are kind of the sources, operating savings, permitting revenue, and new revenue. But how do you pay for it? And so, what Steve told you from a study that Black and Beach had was that 16 percent of the municipalities could self-fund. Well, that leaves the majority not able to self-fund. And so bonds, as many of the municipalities know, if they can keep their millage rate the same, then that's great. If they have to raise their millage rate, then they got to offset their cost someplace else. But then that becomes a taxpayer or citizen kind of debate and a tough one to do. Grants, which I should have included, we're involved in a company called US Ignite that is researching grants that are available Two, four municipalities, you can go to their website and reach it, research it as well. Certainly debt equity is, is just taking out a loan is certainly another way. Um, shared savings, when you talk about the OPEX savings category here, a lot of companies are doing the shared savings. The industry calls those ESCOs, energy services companies. Uh, and that's part of the reason why municipalities are starting with this OPEX savings piece as well. Um, and so shared savings, PP barter, public-private partnership barter is certainly another way to do it where where the smart city solution provider would exchange value for the city. Um, and then a P PPP unique financing where there's companies out there that will do zero money down, but you do, you do a rev share with them, uh, the advertising revenue, the monetization of the revenue, 
and the OPEX savings of the revenue and create that bundle from a solution standpoint. But the monetization is set there. The way to, to fund it from the city's perspective is there. But don't lose sight of the intangibles. Environmental uh, citizen engagement and the, and the satisfaction of that is, is really what, uh, what, you know, is really driving the, the folks that are the elected bodies, right, the mayors and city councils. Excellent. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to the last question uh, of the day as to what is um, from what is your top uh, at three aspects of smart cities today? Is it security, services, traffic issues, or is it the data? So, what are your what are, out of these four? What are the top three aspects of uh, smart cities that are uh, most important to you, um, and what do you think are going to be the uh, the ones that we talk about? So we have a couple of questions, and, and they are somewhat related to technology, Ben, so we're going to try and uh, address them over the next nine minutes. So one of the questions was around the use of blockchain uh, to help monetize smart cities uh, in, in a trustless manner. Um, and I'll, I'll start on it and then pass it over to you, Ben. But, you know, there's like the city of Taipei has been using blockchain in a couple of different models already where it is citizens' data and they want to be able to track the data all the way through. Um, the blockchain consortium and, and a couple of the other blockchain groups have done things like with IOTA where blockchain is being utilized to uh, look at transactions through a smart city and through the process. So we see blockchain as being something that will be more prevalent going forward in smart cities. Uh, ben and I just witnessed in Atlanta a ransomware issue that just occurred. Uh, could that have been avoided with blockchain? Not sure, but it's amazing how it became part of the conversation along with security uh, uh, you know, within the city of Atlanta. So I do see blockchain as being something that's going to help monetize smart cities um, and, and as we start to tr continue to get more and more data. I don't know, Ben, if you had any other answers for that one. No, I, I think that's perfect, Steve. I think the... I think that the issue we experienced with the city of Atlanta and the ransomware was was pretty pretty interesting to follow and, and see the outcome. Yep. Uh, from the answers, it looks like services are number one and security is number two. And I guess they must not live in Atlanta because traffic was down at nine percent, <laughs> and and data wasn't that important yet. So uh, I, you know, not, not what I was expecting, but that's interesting from that standpoint. One of the other questions um, that we have is around the physical media in a city to communicate all these IoT elements and all these uh, systems within the ecosystem of smart of a smart city. Um, I will tell you that I had the opportunity to have a meeting with uh, a cable company that will remain nameless that basically said that as it relates to smart cities, one of the main focused areas would be to protect their infrastructure within those cities. And they are correlating the fiber in the ground and the infrastructure that they're selling to the city directly to the smart city. So I do believe that there is a distinct connection between the infrastructure pieces and the smart city and IoT and things are related to that. Um, what do you think, Ben? No, I, I, I agree. I mean, it, it is as an infrastructure provider, right? I mean, wireless fiber, satellite, um, and you know, we're about to roll out our first net network. Um, that infrastructure is more and more and more important for us to protect and make sure it's secure, but both from a cyber standpoint and a physical standpoint. Excellent. Um, is it obviously right or not to assume a smart town is easier to get to than a smart city in terms of size of effort? Uh, if smart towns could afford it, 
then the answer would be yes. <laughs> we've, been, we've, we've had um, some interesting smaller mid-tier cities start projects, uh, but they've been very, very uh, individually focused in on what they're interested in. So they've had some issue with, uh, the, you know, the, the street lights are needing to be replaced, so they do that. Um, they're doing some security aspects because they're doing that. There's not a lot of traffic needs there. There's not a lot of location-based marketing. So, yes, a smart town is going to be easier because of the size of the effort to be able to do more. It's never more evident than it is in India where they're deploying probably 100 smart cities right now of various sizes, and that's going to be the catalyst for how we can show an ROI in a smaller than large urban area deployment uh, when it's all said and done. Ben, are you seeing any smaller cities or towns uh, deploying or working on deals? Well, it's interesting. Um, Glasgow, Kentucky is pretty innovative in their, um, you, you know, smart city deployments and innovation, uh, which is a pretty small town in Kentucky. But, you know, it's the trade-off between economics and politics, right? The economics is better in a large city, but the politics is challenging. And in a small city, the economics are not so good, but the politics is good. So, you, you know... I think it just depends on the, the leadership and what, what's the right business case you can do to support that city. Yep. And as we were talking, Ben, the, uh, the numbers changed on the uh, top aspects. It's now security and services as the top two. So Great. Interesting how much, and how much secu security is involved. So. And, right, and incidentally, ben, Steve, that, that's, and that's what we're seeing as well. Yeah, I would um, agree. Yep. I would agree. I mean, I think I think traffic and transportation is critical, but it's going to be in the specific areas where it is critical and it's needed. Right. So uh, we're seeing a lot of those people, uh, those cities and those uh, those DOTs really spending a fair amount of time and trying to figure this stuff out. So exactly. Ben, we have a couple minutes left. Um, uh, um, just a couple, another housekeeping. So one of the questions was, can you get the information, uh, uh, the presentation? Yes, if you go to the attachments link, uh, 56 of you have already downloaded uh, the presentation. So uh, you, whoever that was, you can go online and be able to download that, as well as the marketing and propaganda information and links to uh, both um, Ben and his Smart Cities group, as well as the 151 team. So, Ben, in, in uh, one minute, uh, give us an elevator pitch and some of your thought, your final thoughts for the audience, and then I'll give mine, and we are done. Well, thanks, Steve. First of all, thanks for everybody joining. Really do appreciate the opportunity to kind of share our thoughts around the ROI and value proposition to the city. D dealing with the public market, public sector is, is a challenge. Um, leadership changes, um, you've got internal politics, uh, municipalities are very silo-oriented, uh, uh, and so from a services standpoint in at and perspective, it, it's a real challenge to cross the silos, to get everybody on the same page um, and, and work in the same direction, but, but the, the, the people are great. I love working with uh, the, the leadership teams at municipalities and 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 the directors at, at in those municipalities, and they all really have um, the same same goal in mind is how do we better serve our citizens. And and my conclusion piece is that there is a lot of money to be made in smart cities as we go through the next decade or so. There are opportunities whether you're in software, hardware, systems integration. Uh, deployment services, uh, when we start to look at the amount of efficiency, productivity gains, as well as citizen usage, um, the opportunities are there. I will say that we do need to uh, start to address the monetization piece. How are we going to pay for this? Who's going to pay for it? Is there a, such a thing as an ROI in a smart city? So from our standpoint, call us. Talk to us. We'll try and figure it out. Wow. Do you believe I only got 20 seconds left? This is great, Ben. Thank you so much. Thank everybody for being it. We had uh, several hundred people online. 
Uh, so thank you so much for your time and your effort. And if you need us, call us. There's the contact information. Thank you. Have a great day. I appreciate you all being with us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.